Yeah, this new topic is definitely trending. I don't even know where to start with this. This week, while everyone was basically preoccupied with the UAP story, or UFO story, whatever you want to call it, something else created a lot of buzz in the scientific community to the point where I was actually really shocked. It was basically reported, retweeted, and shared with everyone I know. And it's really in regards to these two scientific papers that we're going to be discussing in this video. But ironically, the topic that these papers cover has also just reached a completely new type of a controversy, which we need to discuss in this video as well. And because all of this seems to be happening basically at once, I honestly don't even know where to start. Okay, I guess let's start with what is this actually about. This. It's a phenomenon that many of you are already familiar with. Superconductivity. The unusual transitioning that certain materials go through when they basically lose their classical properties and suddenly acquire a lot of quantum properties, allowing them to perform certain things that would be otherwise impossible. Now, in this case, it mostly means things like levitation. In this case, this is known as the Meissner effect, when the magnetic field is suddenly repelled from within the object and it starts to acquire these unusual properties when next to a permanent magnet. But even more importantly, it suddenly acquires zero resistance, literally allowing these materials to now conduct electricity without experiencing any resistance whatsoever. And the thing is, back in the 80s, specifically 1987, I believe, a major breakthrough in superconductors finally allowed us to use them practically, because the discovery of things like YBCO suddenly allowed scientists to cool down materials using widely available liquid nitrogen. And actually, the list of potential uses for this type of a technology is ridiculously long. Anything from things like fusion, or basically making energy out of hydrogen, to things like quantum computers, and to actually things that we're going to be discussing in a separate video, assuming that the study is correct. But basically, in the last few decades, the major goal for a lot of superconductor studies was very, very simple. Try to find a new material that's able to enter this superconductivity stage at much higher temperatures and, more importantly, at normal air pressures. As you can actually see right here, quite a few superconductors were already discovered that acquire these properties at generally almost room temperatures, but also ridiculously high pressures. Here we're talking about pressures that you might find inside Jupiter, so definitely not very practical. However, a few years ago there was a major breakthrough, or a potential breakthrough. You can find this video in the description, but as the title suggests, a discovery of a room temperature superconductor. And though this younger Anton was very enthusiastic about it, within just a few years, a lot of scientists started to actually question this and realized that it might actually be not entirely true, with the study retracted in 2022 or two years later. But that same team then released another study just a few months ago, once again suggesting that maybe they did discover a superconductor here after all. Now, by the way, both of these studies were published in the Nature magazine so this was a big deal, a huge, huge deal. Mostly because it's usually peer-reviewed by a team of experts. And in that last video that I made a few months ago, I was even pretty confident in stating that, okay, well, first time maybe they made a mistake. But in order to get published twice in Nature magazine with potentially erroneous data, that would be extremely unlikely. There was maybe something happening here after all. Yeah, turns out that that older Anton was enthusiastic for the wrong reasons. He was wrong. Uh, I was wrong. The new investigation, including the team from the Nature magazine, finally confirmed that the data here was most likely manipulated. None of this was probably true. Even going as far as stating that certain graphs were actually taken from somewhere else and were surprisingly similar to previous studies involving entirely different things. And so this really did not look good. It basically implied that both of these papers were kind of faked. Which in this case would be a pretty big deal for Nature because their reputation depends on this but also a pretty big blow for the scientific community. Nevertheless, the main point from all of this is that, first of all, sometimes scientists fake data. It happens extremely rarely, but it does happen. Second of all, there's a system of checks and balances where you can actually verify everything and eventually discover if someone is doing that. And in the last couple of months, there have been quite a few intriguing stories where suddenly this system of checks and balances started to catch up with quite a few extremely highly respected individuals that turned out not to be super honest. And this is really important to understand. Even if you have a ridiculously high reputation, or even if you're a president of a super prestigious university, there's a slight chance that maybe, just maybe, you might have lied somewhere once upon a time. So before we actually talk about the new discovery, let me briefly mention these two other stories that might have actually not been mentioned as much, that underline this really important point that we need to always remember. 
always check everything, do not trust just one study. So let's start with this person. Yeah, I'm not calling him wonderful, for maybe obvious reasons. Marc tessier levin who happens to be an extremely well-known Canadian-American neuroscientist, and who was until recently even the president of Stanford University, now had to reside as a president because in at least four or five of his papers, there was an apparent manipulation of research data by either him or someone else. You can read the report right here, but his research on Alzheimer's was apparently at least partially faked. But exactly who faked the data is obviously unclear. But that was just the first case. The second case was also very prominent. This is Francesca Gino, a Harvard expert on, ironically, psychology of honesty. And essentially, in the last few months, it's been officially confirmed that she's basically been dishonest with her research. You can read the article from The Atlantic in the description, but this title says it all. The Harvard expert on dishonesty who is accused of lying. And so the main point here is that not that scientists lie and there are a lot of lies out there, but the fact that, first of all, your reputation or your standing doesn't really mean much because you could still be technically a liar. On the other hand, at least in science, there's an incredible system of checks and balances. There is always a way to find out if you did lie, and in this case it was either discovered by a smaller team of scientists from Europe, I think it was from Netherlands, or in the case of the Stanford story, it was actually done by a student, with the student then winning a very prestigious journalist award. So yeah, the stories here are kind of mind-blowing. Now I'm going to post some extra articles if you want to read more about this, because that's not really the main point of the story. The main point here is that, even though we should keep our minds open, don't open them enough to lose your brain. I think that's how the expression goes. Let's go back to the main topic, the flying teapots. I mean, superconductivity. So this particular topic is of course super exciting. There have actually been quite a few studies in just the last few months trying to discover new materials, reaching new limits, or discovering even other properties. For example, about a month ago, there was a study involving scandium and new transition stages that it seems to acquire at certain temperatures. Not a particularly groundbreaking study, but still an important new achievement. There was also a really intriguing study from a month prior that essentially tried to use machine learning techniques in order to discover new conventional superconductors. Here the point is to try to find new techniques or new patterns that can be used in the future so that the researchers can then figure out what needs to be synthesized to make this work. The study was not particularly groundbreaking either, but it also made some important discoveries in regards to properties of various materials. But then, completely out of nowhere, in July of 2023, we get hit with two separate papers, well, technically from the same team, showing us a mixture that seems to contain linarchite, copper, lead, phosphorus, and oxygen, that then starts doing this. It starts to levitate in what seems to be room temperature and room pressure. Okay, I think it's better if I just show you the video. I mean, this kind of looks like it's levitating, not fully, but at least partially, which in this case, the research team explains as slight imperfections inside this material, possibly from some kind of a contamination, but the way that it looks so far, I mean, it technically does resemble a room temperature, room pressure, superconductor. Kind of. Sort of. And I mean, I might sound hesitant because I really am. Remember here we went from really complex superconductors that seem to acquire these properties when you cool them down to very cold temperatures, to then a story of two papers in Nature magazine that had to be retracted because of fake data on this topic, and now, suddenly, out of pretty much nowhere, we get this. I mean, yeah, if this is true, then this is basically a discovery of a century. We might have just discovered a material that will solve so many problems. I will talk more about these problems, once again, as I said, if this is proven to be correct. But is this really the room temperature superconductor? Now, right now, if you look up some of the trending uh, topics on this, there actually are already several teams in the US that are currently trying to use the description from the, well, the synthesis steps right here to try to recreate this and to see if they get the same effects, with some of the first potential confirmations possibly coming in the next few weeks or maybe even in the next few days. But at least for now, I mean, I honestly don't even know what to think. But I guess let's try to logically explain some of this just to see if we can make any conclusions. So first of all, when I tried to go to the website for Q Center or the research facility where these sciences work, yeah, blocked due to excessive traffic. That's how groundbreaking this announcement basically was. Luckily for me, this location is actually not far away from me. It is in South Korea. So I'm going to try to see if I can maybe visit it. I mean, I don't know if I'll find out anything, but it will still be interesting to at least try. 
Now, I couldn't really find much about the main author, but the third author in one of the papers, Hyun Tak Kim, is a pretty well-known researcher with quite a large number of citations and published papers to his name. As a matter of fact, let me actually teach you this new concept, H-index. In science, H-index is sort of like your, I guess, GPA score, or if you want to be more gamey about it, it's your game score. The higher it is, the more likely people will take you seriously. In essence, it's a combination between number of papers you publish and the number of times your papers are cited. So you could maybe publish only 5 or 10 papers, but if they were cited by a lot of people over and over and over again, your H index would be ridiculously high. On the other hand, if you publish, let's just say, 20 papers, but not a lot of people cite them, your overall H index is going to be pretty low. Although there is always a way to game this as well. There are quite a few scientists whose names I'm going to possibly not mention just yet that learn to game the system by basically publishing hundreds and hundreds of papers because it does increase your H index by just a little bit. And because in some cases they actually cite themselves, it continuously increases the rank. And so for Hyontak Kim, his H index is 45. That's usually enough to be a professor in most universities and also is even technically enough to become a member of US National Academy of Sciences. Although to be an outstanding researcher, you want this to be over 100. He's not there yet, but he's definitely not someone that you wouldn't take seriously. But in this case, he was only a co-author, while the main researcher is from Quantum Energy Research Center in Korea and is definitely not as well known. But there's already been an interview with him where he basically stated that, well, there seem to be many defects in the second paper, which apparently was also uploaded without his permission. So there seems to be already a bit of a conflict of interest. Although here it's quite clear why. They named this LK99 and extremely recently, the main researcher applied for a patent because assuming that he's correct here, this is literally black gold. Their paper was also published in one of the Korean magazines, but here it's uncertain what sort of a peer review process was involved in this particular study. Normally, for big studies, it's kind of difficult to trust small magazines. Either way, the claims here are pretty big. Apparently, the critical temperature when it loses its superconductivity is roughly around 127 degrees Celsius. That is really high. It basically means you can put it in boiling water and it should still maintain its superconductivity. They also measured the resistance and it seemed to be zero, once again suggesting that maybe this is a superconductor. But this is just based on one of the studies, with all of this still being somewhat unclear. But one of the stranger parts of the discovery is how extremely easy apparently it is to make this. Here the process of making this took less than two days. Quite a lot of other superconductors take way way longer. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions, for example, why is it even possible? The explanation the scientists provide suggests some kind of a slight change in volume and the substitution of different ions that seems to create a unique crystal structure. Or I guess in more common terms, magic. Okay, maybe I'm being overly skeptical here, but yeah, at the moment it's extremely difficult to see if this is actually true. Pretty much all experts so far are being extremely cautious and suggest that all of this might be a result of some kind of an experimental error. But like I mentioned before, there are quite a lot of teams already trying to recreate all of this. And of course, assuming that this is true and the scientists did discover the first ever room temperature superconductor able to operate at ambient pressures, yeah, that's basically a Nobel Prize. Moreover, that would be the first ever Korean Nobel Prize, which would be a huge deal here. But until I get more details or more confirmations, or until someone else is able to recreate this in a completely independent setting, let's just keep our minds maybe a little bit less open and stay a little bit more critical. In other words, we're coming back and talking more about this very, very soon. Until those future videos, check out all of the links, videos, and studies in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye. Okay, Mr. Teapot, let's try this again. Refresh. And still blocked due to excessive traffic. Oh, hey, look, aliens. Maybe a reminder to go watch that UFO Congress hearing. Or maybe I'll just watch another one of these teapots levitate. So much cooler.